Hi hey guys, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us today at uh, RSA. So we are live on uh, YouTube at the moment. So hopefully we'll just talk over to uh, Facebook soon. So for those who are on YouTube already, stay tuned, stay tuned. We'll start uh, shortly. So where is everybody from today? I'm seeing uh new new guys that are to see how the that our uh, webinar session is. If this is the first time for you, you know, to let us know this is the first time joining our race account. So we have S S P Tiger from Cambodia. Um, hi, Srinu, Mister Srinu. Right, so I'm got I'm getting Sanu Jose, that says Russ wins thumbs down. No doubt, there are so many unknown and variables in Bafo. The Russ is mature technology. Uh, yeah, I agree in uh some ways. All right, so just let me swap on my screens around. Oops. So hopefully this makes sense. Having a bit of problem just trying to get it up and ready. Okay, that should be it. So hi Suresh, uh, hi Freddy, hi Srinu, uh, Raj, I don't have anybody in uh, India for consultancy work, but we can provide online support if that's needed. Hi William. So what time is it open in the US? Whereabouts of US are you at? Right, so we are live on Facebook as well. All right. Alright, so we'll start in about five minutes.
So hopefully everybody sees me loud and clear. Let's just let me toggle out to the presentation mode so that it's easier to see. Uh, so I got a question from Harry Haran saying that um, what's the mortality rate for shrimp in a 4 meter tube by flock tank? Uh, so one of our previous uh, pilot study, if you look back our YouTube channel somewhere around December, we actually published uh, some of the results for our shrimp farming system. We've actually gotten 72 to 79% survival, so that will correspond to 21% to 28% uh, mortality rate uh, for shrimp. And this is with a culture cycle of 82 days. Uh, and 82 days in a grow out cycle and we actually gotten about 5 to 7 kilograms of shrimp uh, per cubic meter. And for those who have been following our channel, you might also know that um, we are actually in midway in our grow out ponds uh, right now. So it's about day 42, 6 weeks into our grow out ponds. We just did some sampling. Um, we are roughly at 5 grams already. So I would say for this batch, this current batch that we are doing over uh, in Malaysia, this would actually be better than our previous batch. So um, we are looking forward to share some of the research, uh, some of the results with you. So for the folks on Facebook, I uh, hope you guys are hearing us loud and clear as well. Alright, so uh, I've got a question on Facebook. Um, so they're asking about what, what does SCR actually mean. So SCR means feed conversion ratio. So it's basically how much feed do you require to get one kilogram of shrimp. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, so firstly is trying to understand what is the costing behind producing one kilogram of fish or shrimp. Because a uh, traditional aquaculture business, you will probably have 50 to 60 percent of your operating cost associated with the cost of feed, right? So monitoring this conversion factor, so short name for SCR is really crucial to understand your profitability of the business, right? So for example, um, for pond cultures that are usually uh, subjected to varying weather conditions, you might not have such a good uh, FCR due to changing water quality. So in some cases, your FCR might reach up to 2 to 2.1. For indoor settings, our FCR is about 1.4 to 1.6. Um, for well-managed pond system, can go all the way down to 1.6. 1.3. So obviously it is going to be very very different in terms of profitability when you're running a 1.3 FCR system uh, versus um, a FCR of 2. So hopefully that answers what does FCR mean. It's really important when you're actually trying to uh, determine uh, profitability or trying to determine what's your production cost. The so FCR is uh, dependent on a lot of factors. Right, it's dependent on um, the water quality is dependent on management techniques, uh, dependent on the type of system that you're using. So uh, it's not just one answer and usually it's affected by a lot of other variables as well. The type of feed that you're using, trash fish versus formulated. Alright, so it's 8.31, so let's start um, because this is quite a lengthy presentation. So we'll try to aim to finish between um, 30 minutes. So hopefully it answers a little bit of your questions uh, of regards of uh, which is better between RAS and Bioflock. So the competition between RAS and Bioflock is one of the ones that I've gotten uh, quite a lot of questions on, you know, which is better to produce shrimp. And, you know, to be honest, there is no, there is no one superior method. It really depends on what you're looking at and what you are trying to utilize in terms of uh, cost structure and operating cost. So I'll, I'll share with you some of the um, key points or key consideration that we will be going through, right? So, so first things first, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Yit. So uh, basically, I, 
I design and operate RAS system. So for those who have been following our channel, you probably have seen that we have some experience in designing a RAS system, not a very high tech one, not a very high intensity, but a commercial one that has been up around for a few years. So our RAS system actually has been operating in our micro farm where we have been running it for the past four to five years. And we actually have managed to achieve about 98 to 99% recirculation rate on a daily basis um, so in the past two years we have also ventured into the bioflock system uh, initially we have used the bioflock system for our crab species but we realized that it's more actually more suitable for our bioflock for a shrimp like baname because of the stocking density so we have actually adopted our bioflock system to be applied onto our shrimp farming system so we've been doing that for about a year and a half two years now uh, production's been pretty stable. We have actually going into the our current batch. We have actually cultured six batch of shrimp at the moment. Um, and we have actually reached a sub commercial scale whereby we are actually producing one ton, um, on an annual basis. Uh, fully indoor. Um, we do not recycle some of the water up to two to three cycles. Um, of cultured shrimp, so that will mean about six to nine months culture period without changing water. So our background is really in the wastewater technology where we dabble in system designs and some of the wastewater technology that is uh, relating to whether RAS or biofilm technology. Alright, so some of the key areas of discussion for today will be looking at the key differences between RAS and biofilm. Okay, so I will try to highlight some of the aspects that uh, there are difference in terms of capital costs, right? In terms of the requirements that are needed or some of the main fundamental difference between RAS and Bioflox. And I will sort of highlight the pros and cons of RAS technology, right? So uh, for us, we have actually been doing this for some time, so I think comment relatively well on, on this item, right? Uh, we can also comment on pros and cons of a Bioflox system. We can also look at the suitability of uh, RAS and Bioflox for certain species. So I would you know look at in a way that not all species are suitable for the biofloc speed uh, system, but actually more species or a wider range of species are more applicable in the RAS system. So uh, we are trying to you know, I'll, I'll try to help you zone down in terms of um in terms of uh, what species is actually suitable for what. Uh, I'll look at the scalability of technology as well. So this is important uh, for those who are starting out small. Um, bear in mind that you might not be that small five to six years down the road, right? So you might scale up your production where, 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 uh, whereas you'll be you know, looking at a bigger farm, right, somewhere in the US, or you want to be looking at a farm maybe somewhere in Cambodia or Vietnam. You know, you might be going outdoors or you want to open up a very big indoor kind of farm. So, you know, that's all important. So, um, it's important to look at what have you learned now and how does it transcend or scale into a bigger farm in the future, right? So I'll run through some of the capex requirements for RAS and Biofox. So some of the operating requirements for RAS and Biofox. So that's capex and opex requirement, uh, space requirement for RAS and Biofox and um, look at the operational risk for RAS and Biofox and also the technical competency or requirements uh, with regards to RAS and Biofox. So I'll just go through some of these points uh, individually so that you know, you can sort of uh, look at the, the differences of some of these aspects. Okay, so uh, do leave your questions in the uh, if you're on YouTube, you know, leave your questions. I will reply them uh, after this Q&A. For those who are on YouTube, uh, Facebook, I have a colleague that's monitoring the chat group as well. So I'll answer all of the questions. Okay, so some of the key differences uh, with regards to RAS and Buffalo system is that in a RAS the RAS system actually uses what we call attached growth model, right? Whereby the bacteria are actually grown on what we call a media or biofilter on so. So this is commonly known as the K1 media or is commonly known as the uh, what we call MBBR technology, right? So the biofilm system is actually a suspended growth model, right? In which the bacteria are actually growing on top of themselves, right? So they are going off what we call of a biofloc, um, they are going on to flocks. And flocks are mainly made out of biofilm or EPS, which is exopolymer. Um, EPS, which is a type of carbohydrates that are that are actually being secreted by the cell, 
And if you think about it, it's actually cells that are going on to, on cells, right? So it creates what we call a suspended growth model, right? So if I were to compare the exchange rate between a RAS and a Balfour system, I would think that exchange rate for a RAS system is actually higher, 1% to 2% on a daily basis, and a Balfour system is about 0.3 to 0.5. Right. For RAS system, typically what we do is we'll change 1% to 2% daily. But for Bioflock, we only change up to 6 to 9 months, which in which if you you changing 6 to 9 months is equivalent to changing 0 0.3 to 0 0.5% uh, on a daily basis, right? So the yield, if you're talking about commercial yield, that means the amount of biomass that can be cultured in a RAS system versus a Bioflock system, a RAS system actually have traditionally reach higher yields right so if you're looking at an indoor uh, highly uh, intensive tilapia system it has actually been published and we have already known that you are able to reach about 100 to 120 grams kilograms of fish per cubic meter whereas rust technology has been matured but for bioflock the highest that i have seen being reported by any farmers uh, doing any species, the highest that I've seen is about 15 kilograms per cubic meter, right? Um, so that's about yield. So take note of the differences at the moment between RAS and Bioflox, right? So CapEx requirement for RAS is actually much, much higher uh, than the Bioflox system, right? Because you don't have to buy any MBBR, right? So if you look at a lot of uh, the capital requirement for RAS technology, you will see that the MBBR itself or biofilter will constitute about 10 to 15% of the total capital cost. Right? So if you switch over to a biofloc model, you will see that you do not need this uh you don't need these uh, biofilters and some of the filtration technologies are also much simpler in the biofloc systems, right? So that's for capex. Uh for operating complexity, uh which I see that um uh, Sanu Jose actually made a comment on this. Biofox is extremely complex. Yes, I agree. RAS system, I would say, operating for four to five years, the technical complexity is, I would say, I'll give it a medium score. But if I'm looking at the Biofox system, I actually give it a very high operating complexity. So it's uh, cheap to build, but very difficult to, to operate and run, right? So space requirement for bio, uh, for RAS, uh, I would say is a medium requirement because you know you probably have to accommodate some of the special filtration you need. You need your UV filters, drum filters, you need your protein schemas, right? Biofilters. So uh, space requirement, medium, but for bioflock, you probably just need a septic tank and that's about it. So it's a very low space requirement. So um, waste conversion. So another difference between RAS and bioflock uh, in terms of uh, feed conversion, right? So why a lot of people have been adopting the Bioflock system is because Bioflock can convert some of the waste directly into feed, right? So it, the, what happens in the Bioflock system is uh, some of the microorganisms convert waste like ammonia, right, into a microbioprotein that can be then utilized by the shrimp or the fish. So the goal is to really drive down the FCR, right, to make you make your business a little bit more um, what we call competitive. But of course, these sort of systems are not available in the RAS system, whereby we're actually filtering out most of the ammonia and, you know, it's being uh, consumed by the attached growth bacteria that are adhering themselves into an MBBR system, right? So another key difference between Biofor and RAS system is in the disease prevention strategy, right? So if I look at the RAS system, we always talk about, oh, no, getting your water... Um, crystal clear and passing them through a UV filter whereby it's disinfected, killing all of the viruses and killing you all of the uh, bacteria. But in a biofox system, it doesn't behave this way, right? So if you look at the biofox system, you look, the water actually is very cloudy. So it's actually packed with what we call beneficial microbes. And the disease prevention strategy is really different because what you're trying to do in a biofox system is to, is to pack it with so much good microbes that, 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 they basically exclude against any bad bacteria or viruses or what we call uh, harmful pathogens, right? So it's an exclusion theory, whereas a RAS system is uh, uses a removal theory or disinfection theory. So that's a really important uh, distinction between RAS and Biofox systems, yeah? So hopefully this answers some of the key differences. So the first thing of pros and cons of using RAS systems. So, so one of the pros is... Um, you know, if you're running in terms of complexity, in terms of operations, once you have established your biofilters, it's actually very easy to run. So the first six months will be 
uh, tricky to get your biofilters to get them in place, start running, right? So once you get it run, you know, you obviously do not have any problem down, down the stream. So another good factor is really high intensity. So, you know, previously reported that people can actually achieve up to 120 kilos of fish per cubic meter. So note that for our crab farm, we actually achieve it about 30, 20 to 30 kilograms per cubic meter. And my RAS system is not that high intent. It's, it's not that high intense. It's not that intense, right? So um, it's really suitable for a lot of species. You could do groupers, you could do trout, salmon, all using RAS systems. But you know, it's not really the same for a biofox system. And take note that in a RAS system, you actually have lower OPEX in the in the long run because you do not need to constantly pay for carbon sources to balance out that ammonia, right? So in a RAS system, once you've established a bacteria, you just need power to pump your water around, right? You need your aeration. But apart from that, um, that's all you need, right? Okay, so um, another good thing about RAS is it's less affected by external factors. So for example, if you look at our RAS facility, right? Even though our RAS facility are positioned in a way that, you know, if you look at this picture closely, you can see some of the sunlight that is, you know, emanating through the window. So, uh, of course, it doesn't affect us that much. Uh, being after four years, you know, I don't see problems with having to put your RAS system too near to the window or too far from the window. But the same is not, uh, it's not the same for a backdrop system, right? It's not so affected for a RAS system. It's not that affected by external factors like light sound you know other factors temperature right it's pretty stable but so the cons is really higher startup cost because you know you a typical rust system will have a sand filters drum filters protein skimmer biofilter uv oxygen cone aeration system so a lot of startup costs right but in the long run um slightly lower operating costs in the long run okay so rust system also has a higher SEL because it doesn't have that you know, waste conversion by changing ammonia directly into waste that is, you know, consumable by, by crabs or shrimp, right? Of course, the higher water exchange is also higher than bioflock. And in my opinion, a rust system is actually more susceptible to bacterial outbreak, right? Because you can have all of your UV filter that is functioning, right? But at the end of the day, your UV filter might not effectively clear out some of the attached bacteria that is going around or going or growing inside your culture tank where you buy, whereby you're putting your crabs or your shrimps or you're putting your, your fish. So this is really the pros and cons of a RAS system. Right, so if we look at the next thing, what's the pros and cons of a biofox system, right? So the pros is, you know, lower feed utilization, right? So we already know that, you know, they're able to So um, I lost you guys uh, there for a moment. So for me, personally, I think that um, bifrog systems are less prone for disease outbreak. So give you an example, six batches of shrimps um, being cultured in our system, we have never lost a batch due to diseases, right? But the same cannot be said for RAS system, right? So uh, I really recommend the probiotic effects of the bifrog system. Uh, in terms of fighting bacteria, I think it's a really useful strategy, right? Uh, but note that it is it is coming at a cost, right? So some of the cons include low, I wouldn't say low intensity, I would say it's a medium intensity, getting 5 to 15 kilograms per cubic meter, still much higher production rate than uh, pond cultures, right? Um, second thing is a uh, higher operating cost because now I have to use molasses or carbon sources to sort of balance out the CN ratio to maintain a good biofloc and also have to dose probiotics as well. Okay, I'll cover more on the operating costs uh, down the line. Okay, um, and this is a really important point. They are more affected by external factors. So look at my look at my biofloc system. You will see that one of them are actually closer to the window. This is the tank uh, towards uh, towards the, 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 the picture that you see. And I have actually another tank that's closer to you, right? So this tank, if I compare these two performance for this tank, I would tell you immediately on the spot that the tank that is closer to the window will definitely perform better, right? So this is to say that bioflux are actually very affected by external variable like sunlight, right? And also they are very complex to operate, right? Um, four years of rust experience coming to run bioflux, you know, occasionally I still have to struggle a little bit with process control, so that's really important, okay? And the cons, another of, another cons for running a bioflux system is you really need to find a species that can tolerate high turbidity, right? So varame is one of them, crabs are one of them, but 
I wouldn't think, you know, you using the bathtub system, you'll be able to culture trout. Okay, so um, very important thing uh, to look at the species that you're looking at to culture needs to be able to tolerate high turbidity. That means they need to be able to withstand in cloudy or dirty waters. Okay, so that's pros and cons of the bathtub system. Okay, so again, suitability of species for rust. Okay, um, first thing is you need to understand for there's a limitation for bioflock being the fact that it can only culture species that can tolerate high turbidity. Right, this is number one. Number two, in order for the bioflock system to save you feed, the species that you're culturing needs to have what we call adaptations for them to harvest and consume this microbiotin. So what does that mean, right? So if you're looking at shrimp, specifically baname, baname have what we call filtering structures on their legs that enables them to harvest the flock particles that are floating around and ingest them. So that's really important, right? So no point trying to culture a species that can't utilize or harvest the flock, right? So it doesn't save you any money because the species can't harvest and cannot utilize the microbial protein although they are converted, right? And the third consideration is stocking intensity, right? So why we have moved away from using bioflock on, bio, uh, on crabs is because crabs cannot be stocked at a high intensity as compared to shrimp. So that's really important into achieving what we call commercial status, right? You can't be building a 4x4 four four cubic meter tank and culturing 3 to 4 crabs, right? Because the same for the same area, I could actually culture 1,000 shrimps. So that's the difference between stocking and intensity, right? And some of the other commercial considerations include uh, value, so value, uh, turnover, and also stocking intensity. So these are the three additional points that are really important for you to consider before looking at the specific species to be cultured. Okay, so scalable technology so how well does rust and bioflock scale up right so if i'm looking at the rust technology if today you know if everybody here goes back and invests in their rust system to culture shrimp for example or rust system to culture grouper right so you've done your small pilot system you know behind your backyard or you know you rented a small facility you do it for three years get the hang of it get your market sorted out what's the next step for you right do you A, do you want to produce a commercial scale? That means you know produce a 20,000 or 50,000 metric tons um, RAS facility, which is going to cost you a huge capex, or are you going to scale up in multiple locations, right? So obviously with RAS technology, you can see a couple of options. Number one, I can either go bigger with my current setup, or I can open up multiple locations, you know, somewhere in Germany, somewhere in the US, different states in the US where my culturing shrimp, setting them up, you know, Really, all good news. But the problem when you scale up too big in a in a central location is you will you will have to compete with imported goods, right? So for those in the US, you might have to compete with prices for like you know let's say Vietnam, Thailand, which are major shrimp producers, Ecuador, India, right? Or or fish will be in the Vietnam, right? So these are some of the considerations. So there are not a lot of options with regards to scalability if you are using RAS system, but if I'm using a biofox system, for example, right, you operate your you operate your small biofox system behind your backyard, you know, four cubic meter tanks, two by two meters, really, really compact. You know, you do that for two years, get the hang of it. A, what can you do? You can of course scale up your biofox production to a big facility, right? Um, for example, one in Texas, uh, one one in uh, one one in Florida, you know, for example, right? But again, you have to compete against imported goods. The second point is you might be able to scale multiple location, right? But the most important point for a biofloc system that this is also a technology that is scalable into the pond culture. Okay, meaning to say that you know you might be you know doing your small system behind your backyard and you decided you know you know instead of having to compete what against imported goods, why don't I follow them or follow most of the people who to do a pond production method whereby I'm digging up one acre ponds. You know, lining them and I'm culturing shrimp in these ponds using a bioflock system. Yes, you can do that as well, right? And you can also achieve what we call a low cost, high production method. So, what I would say the differences between scalability is bioflock will not only help you when you're small scale, but when you achieve what we call a very big scale, low cost production, but also will help you in a RAS system 
or a multiple location. So I hope that's uh, really clear, right? Because for us, we can also then apply this technology in a pond setting and you know reap the reap the benefit of using a bioflock system, drive down your cost furthermore, right? Because we already know in the standard standard pond culture it accounts for 60% of your cost. Use bioflock to drive that down and you know, comparing all low-cost producers that will even give me a bigger, bigger advantage. So that this these are a couple of things that to consider when you're scaling up your system or scaling up your business and you know you look at where you want to go in the long run. Okay, so capital cost um requirement for you know RAS versus Bioflow. So if I look at my if I look at my capex for building my crab farm, which is a thousand boxes with its own RAS system, filtration system, you know, buying all these sand filter, drum filter, protein schema, biofilter, you know, blah blah blah. I actually spent up to twenty thousand US dollars to build up my crab farm, right? Is it a lot? Um, yes. Um, but most of the costs are due to having to build what we call the boxes for the crab. So if you are using this uh to culture fish, I would say in the range of seventy to um, which is about fifteen to eighteen thousand US dollars. So slightly cheaper because you still have to buy culture tanks. But if I look at my bioflock facility, right, for a one thousand one hundred ton. A shrimp farming system it only costs about eight thousand to ten thousand US dollars. So this actually matches just back what I said earlier in terms of lower capex capital requirements when you are doing biofilm system. Okay, so if I look at operating costs, right? So operating costs is really important for some investors. Some people prefer to use um you know high capex, low opex, you know. But some for some people who lack the capital, you might want to be looking at uh you know a lower capex and higher opex to offset some of the, the initial capital requirements, right? So for us, the typical RAS opex will include feed, right, power, probiotics, artificial sea salt, alkalinity, magnesium, and calcium sources. These are what we call in terms of what are the basic necessity that you need to run your RAS system. So again, um in a RAS system, what we save it on is power, probiotics, right? Okay, and what we do not what what are we saving less in terms of using bioflock system is because due to the higher water exchange we have to use more sea salt, alkalinity, feed, calcium, magnesium. Okay, so these are what we call the operating advantages of a RAS system, a disadvantages. But if I look at the bioflock in terms of operating costs, I have to what we call I have to pay for feed as well. So feed, power, probiotics. In addition to all of these things, I might need also carbon source, right? So these are unique to a biofox system. But I also might need artificial lighting to, to buffer some of that uh, variation in the external factors. So sea salt is common, alkalinity, magnesium, calcium, right? So if I'm using a biofox system, what I save on because of the lower water exchange, I save on sea salt, I save on feed because the microbiome conversion, right? But I also save on more alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. But on the other hand, I actually utilize more probiotics because I have to ensure that I have a good microbiome system because it's not so stable in the biofilm system. I will also have to consume more power to maintain that microbiome system and I also have to spend more on carbon sources, right? So obviously, which is cheaper? It depends, right? It depends of your accessibility of some of this raw material. For example, it's not uncommon to see biofilm operators to get spent flour from bakery. So if you have that access to raw materials that is cheaper, so of course it will mean a lower operating cost. Okay. Uh, another good point is if you look at power cost, right? If I if I look at Southeast Asia, we know Indonesia has very cheap power and we know Philippines has very expensive power. So I would think a bus system running over in the Philippines will have a slightly higher operating cost as compared to someone who's running in Indonesia, right? So you have to really understand and calculate some of the cost yourself to understand which is the more optimal system for you. Okay, so required space to operate. Um, so for us, uh, for 1000 box system, uh, we are only using about 800 square feet, right? So this is actually very small. Um, for those who are familiar with our channel, you can actually go into our, some of our previous videos and find the link to download some of our floor, floor plan. Right, so for our biofilm equipment to produce, uh, to produce about one ton of shrimp a year, right, and our system is about close to eighty cubic meter, we need about two hundred twenty square feet, right, two thousand two hundred square feet. So for us, we have we haven't made out the floor plan at the moment. Uh, we'll be doing so by end of this quarter. So once I've done it, then you guys can also 
back, right? So these are some of the typical space, you know, to operate at. So hopefully it gives you a better idea of the space requirement if you're looking at crab farming or you're looking at shrimp farming, right? It's not to say or to compare which is actually more uh, more intensive or more saves a bit more space. Yeah? Okay, so operating risk. All right, so this is a, a really crucial point. Okay, so if I'm comparing the amount of time, what we call process upset in which what we call you have issues with ammonia or you have issues with oxygen or you have issues with solid removal, right? These are what I call process. This is what we call process upset. For in a rust system running for four years, once you achieve stability, you know, I have never seen a process upset situation, right? Um, maybe only once or twice where, where we will be, you know, ramping up uh, our capacity of by adding more crabs or feeding more, right? But if I'm looking at the biofloor system, I see process issues almost every once every two months, right? And you need to be experienced and you need to react very quickly to account for this process upset. Because if you don't, the next thing that's going to happen to you is a pool of dying trip, okay? So the risk of process upset is extremely high in the bathwork system, right? I'm sure that uh, Sanu in YouTube, you know, uh, he left a comment earlier. He can attest to this. Many bathwork farmers have all say, faces the same problem. And your knowledge and your expertise is the one and the defining factor for you to run away or to run during, to execute this properly during a process upset issue, right? That really takes experience to run, okay? So another important point is power failure. In a rust system, if you have a two power, two hour power failure, medium intensity, you're going to have maximum five to ten percent mortality, right? Because like for us, crabs are still able to, you know, even without water, they are still able to live for like maybe one or two days, right? Um, yes, I have upset in terms of my biofilter, right? But it's, that's not that's not that's not very critical yet. But in a biofilter system. If you have a two hour power failure, for sure you're gonna have 80% to 900% mortality. So this is really important because once the process is being upset, there is no way coming back from that. So that's really important for a biofox system. Okay, so technical technical competency in terms of or what we call human capital requirement when you're running a RAS system and biofox system is this is really important for investors because you need to think about hiring, right? I can't be running a very small scale plant and running and hiring um I don't know a thirty thousand US dollar per year salary uh aquaculturist right because you have to understand some of the aspects or technical issues with regards to the work that they're required to execute okay so in terms of water quality I think for both brass and biofloor you need a high level understanding right so you know standard things like measuring water quality performing test kits so these are all Pretty simple material. If you have problems with that, look through our YouTube channel. We actually posted a lot of videos in terms of how do you do you know, ammonia tests and how do you do that test, right? So um, another key point is also understanding the culture species, feed requirements. So these are also important. Feed management, I would say they're pretty high in terms of brass and bar flock systems as well. Okay. Um, another key point is uh, disease diagnosis capabilities because for us, uh, we do more disease testing over in the RAS side, right? So things like TCDS plating. So you probably need some sort of a lab facilities to help you do some of this test. But in our experience for BioFlock, less of that re requirement because, uh, you know, having said from the earlier points that are actually a bit more stable, okay? Um, fourth point, understanding a microbiokinetics is key, especially if you're running a BioFlock system. For RAS, not so. So actually, um, nowadays, uh, in our biofloor farm, we actually start to hire a little bit more microbiologists uh, on that, you know, life sciences microbiologists or what we call industrial biotech kind of role instead of our just our traditional aquaculturists because, you know, being from aquaculture background, you might not have a, a enough or strong enough understanding on the microbiokinetics in terms of the biofloor side, okay? But for our side, you know, a traditional aquaculturist would make sense, okay? Um... Fifth point, in a RAS system, if you look at our previous setup or in terms of capex, you'll realize that you have a lot of rotating equipment, things like pumps, protein schemas, stand filtration, drum filtration, so a lot of um, what we call machinery equipment. 
Okay, so it is a plus bonus if your guys can have a very good hands-on skills in terms of fixing simple things like you know, um, changing out the bearings of pumps, uh, fixing gearboxes, uh, simple wiring, you know. That sort of skill set will help you if you are in a RAS system, right? But you know, for Balfour system, what you need is more of um, just aeration and that's it, right? So nothing much you can fix on the blower, right? Uh, anyway, by the time you fix it, it's already more than two hours and your stream have probably paid already. So uh, my suggestion running with Balfour system is, you know, always have a, bare, a spare uh, aeration unit so you can swap out and, and send that unit out to a, you know, appropriate specialist to get it fixed. So, Really key point, key differences in terms of hiring, competency, skill set um, for Rust and Bioflox. Okay, so that's all for um, that's all for this um, PowerPoint. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that that answers some of the questions that you have in mind. And this hopefully this deck actually helped you understand a little bit more about the differences between Rust and uh, Rust and Bioflox technology. Okay. Um, so for, for us, we do conduct courses for both RS system for shrimp and crab farms and we do bioflock uh, systems for shrimp. Okay? So if you're interested, do join us at our courses where we'll be going through not just in terms of theoretical knowledge but also business skills, uh, learning how to calculate your production costs, capital costs, operating costs, yeah? And also some of the practical skills with regards to things like competency, like micro, and looking at the microbiome community, understanding microbiome kinetics, how to look, use a microscope, how to do, how to use test kits, uh, how to measure water quality, how to handle crabs, how to do sampling, uh, how to operate some of the equipment. Okay, uh, we'll also try to help you to network with other people who are looking uh, at building up the farm, supplying equipment, off taking. So that's where you know with our. We actually have more than a thousand students enrolled with us online and offline. So hopefully we can help you with some of the net well. Okay. So for us, uh, we do have uh, two courses. RAS for mud crab that is about eight nine nine ringgit. That is two hundred and thirty five US dollars. Uh, this is the course that if you join us in Malaysia, right? Um, and for our shrimp farming course is thousand six. 1599 ringgit, which is about 400 US uh, if you join us in Kuang. But I know for most of you, you're not able to travel due to the pandemic, and I highly don't encourage I highly encourage you guys not to travel to Malaysia because you have to serve a 14 days quarantine, so you can always uh, enroll online as well. Okay, for our RAS system, it's 109 US dollars for my crabs, for our Bioflock system, it's 199 US dollars. Um, it's all available on our website fully recorded you can access pay and access anytime and good news for you if you have actually enrolled online and decide to visit us in malaysia after the pandemic we welcome you and we will give you a full rebate on the online course anyway so it's almost similar to saying that you will get the online course free if you join the ones in malaysia so hopefully i hear good news from you guys and if you guys need to contact me um, this is my number and this is my email and do drop us a message if you have any issues. Okay, so I'll start with the questions on YouTube first. Um, so hopefully, you know, we get a bit of a, a Q&A session for everyone. Alright, um, so just let me scroll through of the YouTube comments first and I'll go I'll walk through them sequentially. Okay, um Okay. So Sanu Jose, Ras spring thumbs down, no doubt. There are so many unknowns and variables in Balfour Aquaculture. Ras is mature technology. Um, so Bioflock is a head only initial investment. So hopefully I've, under, I've explained that. Um, another key point to, to take note is RAS has been around for some time, right? Bioflock, I would say five to six, five to ten years. Um, but the thing is Bioflock technology is still a developing technology. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't count it out just yet because as feet, so one of the problems in aquaculture is uh, feed meal, right? So for us, for those who have uh, watched the recent Netflix 
Piracy, right, who talked about the use of fish meal in aquaculture. Um, fish meal will only get more expensive over time. And Bioflock is one of those technologies that might potentially reduce um, the feed consumption, right? So if all things being equal, if feed cost rises by 100%, you will see that Bioflock might be the only viable technology which can reduce the feed consumption or you know, retain that profitability over the long run. So I wouldn't count it up yet. Uh, like all startups or all new technology, it's important that you know the industry have time to develop to maturize uh, this technology. And I would say it needs a bit more time, especially not just not just only for indoor, but also even in the pond culture as well. And I think that the sectors that are that are heavily involved in developing this technology is beyond just aquaculture technology, but also in terms of uh, life sciences and in terms of what we call a uh, microbiome or biotech industry, right? Um, so, hi, hi, hi. Okay, what's the mortality rate? I already answered that, right? So for four cubic meters, so traditionally the best mortality rate we have gotten uh, out of 82, cult 82 days culture cycle is 21%. Um, of course, the worst I've gotten 80%, right? But the recent last batch, the best was 21%. All right. Um, uh, got a question from Crocodile, right? Can I get this PPT? Uh, this will be uploaded on YouTube, so hopefully that um, uh, that you know you can look it at your own spare time, right? So please, from Spotty Boy, please suggest how can we get rid of rapid increase of nitrates, uh, in RAS? Is there a low cost reactor available for two lax liter water capacity? Uh, well, we don't want to go. Okay, okay, okay. Understood. Um. Traditionally, nitrates in rust systems are removed by water exchange, right? So 1 to 2% on a daily basis. Um, for us, that economics makes sense. But if you want to save more water, what you can look at is a denitrifying process in which uh, you can add an external carbon source like ethanol or methanol. Online denitrification, very low flow rate uh, to reduce the nitrate. Okay, so it's been done already. Uh, whether you want to incorporate in your system will depend on economics. Whether is it A, cheaper to buy a denitrifying system or B, cheaper to water change. Is it cheaper to, wa to exchange water? So um, you can look this up. It's called a denitrify online denitrifying system. Um, you can just build it yourself. It's pretty simple. Okay. Uh, so another question from William. Minimum salinity for bioflock. have to make mine. Um... We use about 10, 10 PPT. Uh, for us, we've been doing quite well with 10 PPT. I wouldn't think, so for us, salt cost is more like a capex, right? So once you make it, you know, you don't have to change it after three cycles. So for us, I would prefer using at an ideal salinity about 10 as supposed of trying to go at minimum. Um, the minimum I can, I can advise, I've seen is about six. But um, probably at the cost of a slower growth rate. So I would prefer to do something about 10, you know, figure out ways to save water. But if you can't, I would, I would say 6 would be six would, no, no, best for your case. Um, admin, uh, do you offer consulting services? We are farming tilapia now. On your, okay, um, yes, we do. Uh, we have tilapia farms as well, um, which we have not covered yet. So... We have tilapia farms as well, running on a semi biofloc systems. Uh, hopefully, I will start making more more content on our tilapia. So we are using what we call monosex or hybridites, uh, fast growth breed running on our biofloc system. We run them on our nursery as well. Um, we can advise. Uh, of course, probably you want to go through. I would think for a tilapia system, you want to be looking at a biofloc system or a RAS system. Okay, because bio Tilapia is all about SCR, right? So I'm not too sure at mean where you're from, but if let's say if you're from Malaysia, uh, the tilapia cost, the, the price of tilapia is about seven, 650 to 7 ringgit, which is about 185 US dollars. And the feed cost now is already at 3 to 350 ringgit, right? So if your SCR is about 1.5, 
your production cost based on feed is already five ringgit. So it's uh two two ringgit gross profit per kilo, right? So if you can use Bioflop, reduce that to one point three, you're saving a lot of money, right? So uh look at that. You know, consider using Bioflop for system and come talk to us about you know trying to use Bioflop for your tilapia farms. Um how to maintain pH of RAS system. We are using COC3 but pH decreases or so the not getting results. Uh, I'm surprised that you're not getting results using sodium bicarb, right? So if you're not getting results, the first thing I would recommend looking at is solubility. Um, look at whether your sodium bicarbonate and your CaCO3 are well mixed and are they being dissolved properly before adding it. Okay? Uh, our hatchery is RAS, ponds are bioflock system. Uh, okay, so this is from... Uh, ponds are about So... Yeah, you are, you are already running with the system, right? So um, probably you can drop me an email with the specific filtration system you are looking at. Um, BPM June stock. Is there anyone that teach Bioflop in Philippines? Uh, not that I know yet. So Bioflop is still quite a new technology, at least in the Philippines. Um, so do, do take note. Uh, you can be one of the first few guys that, that learn Bioflop. Uh, in the, in the Philippines. Anyway, we have an online option, right? So, okay, you're in Saipan. Oh, okay. Um, okay, drop us an email so that I can see some what are the what are the filtration requirements that you need. How can you avoid white spot disease in shrimp? Okay, number one, get SPF larvae. So shrimps, you can buy those that have health cert free of white spot and maintain good biosecurity. So for us, we are fully indoor, so I don't have to worry about you know, white spot coming in with birds or coming with other predators or coming in water exchange. Okay. Um would like to have my own hatchery. Is that something you could offer services for? Uh yes, we can. But hatchery business is a tricky business to run. Unless you are in Saipan, right? Uh Maria North Mar Northern Mariana Islands, I wouldn't highly recommend going for a hatchery business. Um, if you're in the US, you should be able to source PR uh, locally, right? I think you can source them from Hawaii, right? Uh, instead of trying to run your own hatchery business. Because it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of money to run a profitable hatchery. You need a lot, you need a very big scale. So that's really important to take note. Usually it's reserved for industrial Indus big big industrial player like CPs to venture into this industry. Alright, um so the guys on Facebook, um hopefully these guys are still around. Are we using aeration oxygenation for biofog? Of course, right? Biofog you can't run without aeration and you know if you don't have aeration, your shrimp will die out in two hours. Um if I'm understanding your question, probably you're asking, am I using pure oxygen and biofog? Answer is yes. We have a series of systems. We have oxygen cones that are concentrated with oxygen, pure oxygen. We also have nano bubble system, which I will shortly, you know, announce and show you guys. Um, so hopefully, you know, that answers your question. Oxygenation system is key to intensification in biofox, right? Um, how would you calculate the amount of aeration? So just to ballpark, I would say one hundred cubic meter. You could use about. Well, two horsepower is more than enough. Two horsepower aeration, uh, is more than enough for for a, what we call medium intensity bioflow system. Okay, so hopefully I've answered all of the questions on Facebook and YouTube, and it's uh nine sixteen, just one minute, uh delay. All right, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed this this webinar session. Um, so hopefully you can leave your questions in your email. You know, if you want to learn more, drop us a drop us an email. Or learn, you know, tell tell us how we can help you, and let's let's start your let's get your farm started, right? Hopefully by this year, uh, before the pandemic ends, right? So once it ends, then you can fly over to Malaysia and hopefully get get catch a glimpse of our our farms, uh, both for us and uh, by flock. Okay, so that's all for today. Uh, thanks again for joining us at RS Agriculture. Do like and subscribe if you like. Good night. Stay safe.